Let's move on to speak about the ionic basis for the electrical activity in the heart. Now we've talked about how the electrical activity spreads. Let's talk about what ions are moving to allow for that spread. So we will start by thinking about the pacemaker cells because they behave differently. They are going to spontaneously depolarize. Our contractile cells on the other end are going to receive the impulse from the pacemaker cells and they're going to behave differently and we'll talk about them uh, coming up. So the autorhythmic cells will spontaneously depolarize by way of closing of potassium channels and opening up of two types of channels. That's the first step to result in this spontaneous depolarization, okay? So we, op we close potassium channels and we open up sodium and potassium channels. Now these are referred to as funny channels in your textbook and in some literature. And these are channels that allow the movement of both sodium and potassium, but more so sodium. So these allow for the opening up of sodium and they result in the net depolarization. That is more sodium moving in than potassium moving out. So that's gonna cause depolarization. What helps to further this depolarization is the opening up of calcium channels. So calcium channels will open up Again, calcium, positively charged ion, inward ECDF, so it's gonna result in more calcium moving in, and that's gonna further result in depolarization. And we're gonna depolarize to threshold. So threshold, um, so uh, contractile cells and pacemaker cells also have their threshold potential, which is the action, which is the um, membrane potential beyond which the action potential must proceed, right? That threshold, very similar to any other neuron um, in our pacemaker cells. So we open up what's referred to as fast calcium channels. We're gonna talk about another type of cell that's called slow calcium channels that uh, will stay open for much longer. But our fast type of channels, also called the T type of channels, and T stands for transient because they open for a very short period of time, but very quickly. Okay, so they open up, calcium moves in, and this is what results in the action potential, right? And then from there, we repolarize by way of opening up potassium channels. Remember, we started by closing those potassium channels. And so in order to repolarize the cell, very similar to any other neuron uh, or any other excitable cell, we're gonna open potassium channels, potassium will leave the cell, and that will result in the downward of the membrane potential referred to as repolarization. Okay. Um, so again, an illustration of that here. So just to re um, uh, remind ourselves, we're looking at the ionic movement that results in an action potential in a pacemaker cell. And this is specifically cells that can spontaneously depolarize. So there's no other outside influence. There's no neuron, there's no neurotransmitter that results in this type of ionic movement. By way of opening and closing of these channels, this is all happening spontaneously, okay? So we start at negative 70, which is our resting value. Notice how threshold is no longer negative 55. For muscle cells, it's gonna be negative 50. So here's one difference between a neuron and our pacemaker cell. Now, in order to begin the action potential spontaneously, we have the closing of potassium channels and we have the opening of funny channels, right? This, the channels that allow both sodium and potassium to move, but more so sodium. Those channels open up and that's gonna be the green part of this curve. So we go from negative 70, because we have more sodium moving in, this is gonna slightly depolarize our membrane potential from rest up to about uh, negative 60 or so. And then from there, we're gonna trigger the opening up of fast calcium channels, referred to as T-type or transient calcium channels. And they are gonna allow for calcium to move. So notice we have an increase in the membrane permeability to calcium and a decrease in the membrane permeability to sodium as we open those calcium channels, but close those funny channels, right? Really important to understand that swap uh, at this point in the membrane potential. 
So calcium moves in and that's gonna further depolarize the membrane. And now we're gonna pass that threshold potential or that threshold value. And then we're gonna have the opening up of slow calcium channels. So slow calcium channels are gonna stay open for longer. That's why they can result in the upward stroke of our actual potential because they actually open up and stay open up for a longer period of time. Uh, and these are sometimes called L-type channels. You may see that in your text, L-type uh, calcium channels as opposed to T-type. And they result in the upward stroke of the action potential. And notice I have two arrows because this really increases the membrane permeability to calcium and it causes a significant depolarization in the membrane potential. Now, at the peak of the actual potential here, we have a swap. So we open calcium, uh, excuse me, potassium channels, and we close those, uh, uh, those calcium channels. Both of those end up closing. And so now we can have the repolarization of our membrane potential. All right. Okay, so here is a review of that here. Okay, um, here is a schematic that shows what's happening with our pacemaker cells. So we depolarize to negative 50. We have the upward stroke of the action potential. We have the swap where we open potassium, close calcium, and then we depolarize to rest. Let's look at the ionic basis in our contractile cells. So these are our cells that receive the impulse from the pacemaker cells, and these are the ones that actually have the sarcomeres going, they have the contractile units, they shorten and actually change the shape of our chambers, and they are gonna act a little bit differently in terms of the ionic movement that results in their action potential. So we have phases that are, um, describing the different parts of the action potential here. So phase zero is increased permeability to sodium. All right, that's kind of where we start off, where sodium is moving into the cell. Phase one is where we stop that sodium movement, okay? We block or stop that sodium movement for a very specific purpose, and that is to allow the movement of calcium. So phase two is where we now have an increased permeability to calcium and a decreased permeability to potassium, okay? Now phase two is a very important phase and phase two is allowing calcium to move into the cell. That calcium has a very specific role. It's going to be responsible for the action potential, but also that calcium is gonna enter the cell and serve as the source of getting the contractile units going in the muscle, all right? And we talked about the way that calcium is super important for regulating the muscle contraction. So phase two here is where we stop the depolarization. So notice we had depolarization going here, and then we paused it in phase one. We stopped the movement of sodium to interrupt that depolarization and to result in the movement of calcium. So phase two, I like to result as a, I like to refer to as a pausing state, a pausing phase. It interrupts depolarization and it intentionally allows calcium. All right, I lost my connection for a minute there. Okay. All right, so let's get back to this. So we were talking about phase two being that interrupting phase so that calcium can enter the cell. And as you will see, the source of calcium for smooth muscle contraction and for cardiac muscle contraction is outside of the cell. So phase two allows for that calcium to move into the cell and it's gonna be really important to regulate the contractions by way of engaging with the uh, contractile units, right? The uh, tropomyosin and troponin to help these contractions going. Phase three is where we interrupt or stop that uh, movement of calcium. We increase permeability for potassium and decrease permeability for calcium. And then phase four is where we repolarize back to rest. All right. So the cardiac contractile cell is going to have a longer duration than we saw with skeletal muscle. So a skeletal muscle contraction 
is anywhere from one to two milliseconds. Uh, a cardiac muscle contraction is about 250 to 300 milliseconds. And that also is important for that phase two event that we described in order to pause depolarization so that calcium can come into the cell from the extracellular environment and actually help get the, uh, the regulation of the contractions going. All right, so here is our, uh, our drawing, our schematic for the contractile cells. So we start at negative 90, another very crucial difference between the pacemaker cell and even our typical neurons and the contractile cells. Contractile cells start at a more negative resting membrane potential value of about negative 90. Okay. And that is also helping to lengthen the duration, right? It starts way more negative. So it simply is going to take more time to get this action potential uh, going. So we start at negative 90. And here, what, we what do we have going? We have increased permeability for potassium, which explains our resting state. Remember, the uh, equilibrium potential for potassium is negative 94. So in order for us to start way down here at negative 90, we're going to have a lot of potassium channels opened up so that our membrane potential looks very similar to the equilibrium potential. We have no sodium movement and no calcium movement. So we have decreased permeability for sodium and for calcium, and we have the cells starting at negative 90. Phase zero is the opening up of sodium channels, and now we have an increased permeability for sodium movement, and sodium can wash into the cell, and that gives us our spike in the membrane potential from negative 90 all the way up to about positive uh, 30 or so, right? So way positive on our scale. And then we have an interruption in the depolarization. We're going to close the sodium channels, and that is going to stop the movement of sodium, but then we're going to open up calcium channels and close potassium channels. And the reason for this is that we don't want to start repolarization right away. We want to leave some time, okay? This is referred to as the plateau phase, or what I like to say as the stalling phase. The cell wants to stall here for a little bit. It wants to linger here to allow that calcium to get into the cell to because that calcium is so important to, keep, to to power or sustain the contractions, can't talk. Um, so the plateau phase allows the cell to kind of stall a little bit, right? Notice how it's moving sideways in terms of duration. And this is what allows the time that it's needed for calcium to get into the cell. And now after calcium moves into the cell with that plateau phase, now we have repolarization. So we can flip-flop the orientation of these um, channels. We can close calcium channels and open potassium channels, and the cell can continue repolarizing. So that plateau phase is very important. It is where we interrupt what the cell is doing, interrupt repolarization by stopping the movement of mm -hmm. potassium. If we kept potassium moving, we would repolarize the cell faster than what is you know, required to get adequate uh, amounts of calcium into the cell to power the contractions. All right, so here is our, um, uh, our illustration here once again. So we start at negative 90 with phase four. Okay, notice that phase four starts this contraction and ends it as well. So both events will be at negative 90. And then we rapidly depolarize by opening up sodium channels. Okay, and uh, we're also going to close potassium channels here. Now we're going to have a brief period where we try to begin repolarization by closing sodium channels and opening up potassium channels here. Right, remember, potassium is going to try to repolarize. So if you open up those potassium channels, it's going to try to um, uh, give us that downward stroke, which is what our other action potential curves look like. But specific to contractile cells, we're going to interrupt that repolarization. So here is where we have the 
closing of those potassium channels to stop the repolarization or interrupt it rather, and open up calcium channels so that calcium can do its thing. It can move into the cell. Here is our plateau phase, which is phase two. And then we're gonna have the uh, opening up of potassium channels, closing of those calcium channels, and the cell can continue repolarizing. Okay. Now, as far as thinking about the excitation contraction coupling in cardiac muscle, in the contractile cells, it is due to very similar structures that it was uh, due to in skeletal muscle. So the T-tubules, which are also present in cardiac muscle that have helped the excitation spread throughout the muscle quickly, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is where calcium is stored. Note here, however, that in skeletal muscle, the calcium that allows the contraction is coming only from the SR. In smooth and cardiac muscle, calcium comes from two sources. It comes from outside the cell, but also from the SR. So the calcium is gonna be coming from two sources in smooth and cardiac muscle. The other property is the troponin tropomyosin regulation. Okay, the troponin tropomyosin regulation. So the fact that troponin is binding the calcium Tropomyosin is uh, joined to troponin, and then there's that configurational change, which helps to regulate the contraction and turn it on and off, right? That is resulting from calcium. The properties that are similar to smooth muscle are the gap junctions, right, to help this unit act synchronously, to help the heart beat as one uh, synchronous tissue and the extracellular source of calcium. Again, this is a feature that is shared between both cardiac and smooth muscle, right? Um, okay, let's talk about the steps of the uh, spread of that contraction. So how we result in the regulation of that contraction. So basically we start with depolarizing one cell this would be a contractile cell that is neighboring the cell in question, or it could be an autorhythmic cell like a pacemaker cell, which is initiating that uh, citation and then spreading it to the contractile cell. So this cell from which we are receiving the impulse can be one of those two types of cell. So we spread the impulse from one cell to the other by way of our gap junctions, again, unique to only smooth muscle and our um, cardiac muscle. And then the impulse begins the opening up of calcium channels. So remember, in this type of cell, we have two sources of calcium that allow for the uh, regulation of contraction. One is coming in via calcium channels on the membrane, and this is extracellular calcium. The, okay, the other source will be from the SR. So both of these result in calcium binding to troponin, the similar steps that we talked about for skeletal muscle, and then resulting in muscle contraction. And in order to cease that contraction, we have to pump that calcium back into the SR but also back outside of the cell. So because we had two sources to begin with, we now have two routes to rid the, the, the sarcoplasm of this calcium in order to cease contraction. We can pump it back into the SR by way of calcium ATPase pumps on the SR, or we can pump it back to the external extracellular fluid by way of calcium ATPase pumps on the surface of the cell. And then a third option is that we can simply exchange it for sodium across the extracellular membrane as well. Okay. Um, so here are these steps and just to review them uh, for repetition here. So we've got our excitation spreading by way of gap junctions to allow calcium channels on the membrane and the SR to open up, that calcium is going to engage with actin, specifically the troponin component of actin. That's gonna allow for cross-bridge cycling to occur. So the uh, sarcomere here can contract 
And then now we have to rid the sarcoplasm of this calcium to cease the contraction. And we can do that in three ways. We can pump it back into the SR, we can pump it back into the extracellular surface, or we can exchange it for sodium, not actively pumping it, but simply our anti-transport, which is our secondary active transport, and then we can rid the uh, calcium in that way. All right. Now, um, just reviewing that here on these final slides, in order for relaxation to occur, we can remove it by pumping it back into the SR, pumping it back across the membrane, or exchanging it across the membrane. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to just introduce here quickly is that we can think about the electrical activity of the heart, and we can measure that by way of the electrocardiogram. So this is the non-invasive technique. This is what happens when you go to the physician. Let's say you've been having chest pain. You go to the ER. They send you for an ECG or an electrocardiogram just to make sure that the electrical conduction of your heart is working appropriately, and you don't have an arrhythmia or a disorder of your heart heart uh, going. So this is how we check for that. So it's used to test for any kind of clinical abnormality that could be related to the conduction of the electrical signaling through your heart, right? And the disorders associated with that are referred to as arrhythmias. So you have these conductors um, or these um, leads rather placed onto the external surface of your skin, your body's gonna act as a conductor, right? So this is how we detect the spread of electrical activity by way of placing the leads on your skin. And this is true for an ECG, an EMG, which is your muscles, right? An EMG will be on your uh, muscles or an EEG, which is an encephalogram, um, and that'll be on the surface of your scalp, which can detect electrical activity of your brain. So ECG for your heart, EMG for your muscles and nerves, and then EEG would be for your brain, brain wave activities. Um, and so it will detect the size of these potentials, as well as the synchronicity. Are these uh, units beating as one? Uh, is there disjointedness? Is there detachment? And this kind of leads back to that question I got earlier, where if the SA node is not working, we're going to have different parts of the, heart in, of the heart kind of doing their own thing, because there's no one in charge sort of setting the pace and saying, this is how we're going to beat. This is how fast we're going to beat. This is how we're going to control the weight and the conduction of that rhythm. And so without the SA node, we can have uh, a disjointed um, you know, nature in terms of the spread of that, that um, electrical activity. So these are things that can be picked up by the ECG. So the heart electrical activity should be synchronized. Each unit should be beating as one, and that's really important for good cardiac function.